So I hope you enjoyed that uh, video of uh, Doug Crockford. He's a uh, he's a pretty funny guy. He's got sort of a, an irascible sense of humor. You can uh, find some more of his talks on uh, on YouTube. Uh, one of one of his probably the the funniest things is this uh, this picture that's wandering around the around the the internet. Uh, Douglas Crockford wrote a book called JavaScript: The Good Parts, and uh, and so the what we see here, of course, is here is the book that talks about JavaScript: The Definitive Guide, which is like everything, and then the uh, book called JavaScript: The Good Parts is uh, it's much smaller than JavaScript: The Definitive Guide. Um, part of the reason for that is JavaScript is a really, really uh, deep and powerful language, as you probably have seen with the video. If I've shown you the video of uh, Brendan Eich, it's a very he was very thoughtful when he designed the language to seem simple on the surface, but yet be uh, subtly complex and powerful uh, just under the surface. And so that's why there's a, there's sort of a big difference, kind of like doing JavaScript at at the light level and doing JavaScript in an awesome level. And so as Doug uh, mentioned, JSON, it, he didn't exactly invent it. He just came up with a term to legitimize the notion. And JSON.org describes it, and he hasn't changed it barely at all since he came up with the idea. And, and that, as he said, is one of the charming things. So in the debate of XML versus JSON, um, XML has its advantages. Uh, JSON has a lot of advantages, and in, in many situations, uh, people would push XML where JSON would have been more appropriate. So there's a bit of a backlash against XML, but there's, there's still places where XML is useful. But when you just have two applications and they really just want to send some lists and dictionaries back and forth, JSON is a much better way to do it. Both applications kind of know what they're looking for, um, and so JSON represents data as nested lists and dictionaries. This is another sort of form of sort of composite data structures where, you know, when we, before we talked about data structures, it's a, a list or a dictionary. And then we got to the point where we had a list of tuples, which is more of a composite data structure because it's a data structure that within it has data structures. Well, in JSON, we just kind of go crazy. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, as as the joke says. Um, and it really has two basic primitive structures that are repeated over and over and over again. And that is, they map exactly on to Python's dictionaries and Python's lists. And the this, this particular bit of JSON is using just the dictionary format. Of course, it's a triple quoted string, but the open brace and close brace are the indication that we are uh, starting a JavaScript object, which is a set of key value pairs. So this is name maps to Chuck, it's a dictionary, comma, and then phone maps to, but this is now another dictionary, type maps to international, number maps to this string, and then that's the end of this thing. <clears throat> and then email is another dictionary with only one key and one value. So this is a dictionary that contains two dictionaries within it okay and so this is a sort of a composite data structure okay and much like what we had to do with xml we load a the library using import import the json library json is built into python uh, in the more recent versions that we're using and you basically take the string data and you do json.loads, which parses this and turns it into internal Python data structures. But the difference is, unlike XML, which is kind of this tree structure, it actually is exactly Python structures at this point. So this means that what we get back in info is a dictionary. And if we want the word Chuck, if we want the word Chuck, we simply say info sub name. So info is this outer dictionary, and the key name and the value is Chuck. So it's like give me info sub Chuck. No querying, no nothing, right? It just is a Python dictionary when we get it back. So if we then take a quick look at how to get at 
this value right here. Well, info sub email, well, that's this bit right here. Actually, it's this bit right here. Ah, let me start that again. Info sub email is this dictionary. So info sub email is itself a dictionary. Then we say sub hide to look deeper into it. And then this value is yes. So you see that the JSON just it just there's no sort of querying or finding or find alling or looking up. It's just there. Now you'll also notice that this is not nearly as self descriptive. We don't have the less than person and all that other stuff that gives us a clue as to what's actually going on in here. But if we know what we're looking for and we're just looking for the name thing and it's always going to be the name thing, we just write info sub name. And so JSON really is a very direct representation of lists and dictionaries as a wire format. And that's why it's very, very popular compared to XML when you really just are sending data between two cooperating applications. Here's an example of a uh, list of dictionaries. And so in, Py in, uh, in <coughs> Python, well, Python the same way, JSON and Python kind of look the same. Um, here we have square brackets, just like a Python list. And the first item in this list is this dictionary, followed by that comma, followed by the second item in the list is this dictionary. So we have a two item list. So when we parse this whole thing using json.loads, we get back info is a list of dictionaries. Because this is a list of dictionaries. In this case, there's only two of them in the list. Our dictionary, our dictionary, I mean our list contains two dictionaries. And then each dictionary has some key value pairs. And so we dereference these things. Actually, I probably should uh, uh, add a little example. A simple dereference would be info sub zero sub name. Because info is a list, sub zero is that one right there, and then within that, Chuck is subname. Okay, so again, this is just Python syntax. Info is a list, sub zero is the first element of that list, and the thing that is the first element of that list is a dictionary, so we, to look up the name value, we do subname. We could also take info, which is a list, right, a list of two dictionaries, and now we can have a for loop for item and info. So that means that item is going to be an iteration variable. It's going to first look at this, and then it's going to look at that. Item is going to be a dictionary. So we can say item sub name, which is this bit right here. We can say item sub ID, which is this bit right there, and item sub X, which is that bit right there. So you just tear these things apart, right? The curly brace things turned into dictionaries, and the square brace things turned into lists. And, and, and again, like I said, it's, it's not as self-describing, but if you know what it's supposed to be, then your Python code looks really simple as you take this stuff apart, okay? So, once we have a serialization, we use sort of HTTP to move this data back and forth. One application produces data and another application consumes data. It leads us toward a notion called a service-oriented approach. And a service-oriented approach is a place where we break our applications into multiple pieces and often run them in multiple servers. Take something as complex as Coursera, they have lots of servers that do special purposes. And your user interface that you see is pulling data from many servers, different, different kinds of servers and pulling them together. One might be a server that tells who's registered in what courses. Another might be the threaded discussion server. Another might be the video server. 
And so what you have is you have you break your application into multiple services, and then you basically sort of compose those together to produce what seems to be an application. Another good example of this would be um, airline reservation systems that try to sell you hotel rooms and rental cars. Well, airlines don't have rental cars, and they don't have hotel rooms. They just call a rental car web service, a, a rental car service, and a hotel room service. And they got their own data. And so somehow in this thing you can buy a flight, a rental car, or a hotel room. And they're, you know, they book them, book them by making calls to those services. So this is called a service-oriented approach, where you don't try to build on every application to do every single thing. It does its thing and it takes services from other applications. And when we are going to use services, especially those that don't belong to us, like if many airlines want to talk to the car reservation system, they have to come up with a standard that says, okay, if you're an airline company and you want to talk to our car reservation system, here is a standard. These things are called APIs or application program interfaces. So using these APIs, we can standardize and make it easier so that by the time it's all said and done, once our airline system talks to one car company, car rental company, it can talk to 50 different car rental companies. And so the act of studying these APIs and standardizing these APIs to make things simpler, to reduce everybody's cost, is an important part of uh, IT development. The building of standards is an important part of IT development. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I do a whole bunch of my time. So here's a, so here's a video um, that sort of gives an idea of the value of this uh, service-oriented approach about how we use services across multiple parts of an application and exchange data back and forth and then apply standards at each of those service boundaries.